Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. Hi, I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. This evening's edition will host legislative issues with Jim Parisi, where we bring the legislature into your living room. We hope you enjoy this edition of Legislative Issues and Labor Vision. Thank you for joining us for this edition of so, Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field rep with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. We have been having some shows uh, with different legislative, uh, labor leaders talking about legislative programs, and today we're going to continue our discussion with the building and construction trades. With us, we have Michael Sabatoni and Scott Duhamel. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you, you again, too. Jim. So at the previous show, we uh, ended by talking about the Dynamo House in the Jewelry District, not the Knowledge District. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and uh, I know that there's also one other major construction project that's being discussed in the halls of the State House, and that's one of the big bond issues. Uh, what, what's going on in South Kingston? Well, actually, the, there are a few pieces to uh, uh, the, the budget that we had seen in the request for bonds. The biggest piece uh, is in South Kingstown. It will be about a $125 million uh, bond question to uh, construct uh, the engineering school down in the uh, Kingston campus at URI, which is a, a really exciting project. I don't know if uh, you've been down there recently, but um, uh, the transformation and the investments that, been, that have been made in that, uh, in that university have been tremendous. Uh, we've got the School of Pharmacy. Uh, and the, this is just another piece of the puzzle for the natural progression of that campus. But you also have other uh, uh, pieces. Uh, you have uh, about a $70 million bond question that will go to continue for the, uh, for the clean water and sewer for the cities and towns through the DEM, which would stimulate a lot of immediate construction activity as well as the long-term uh, infrastructure of water and sewer in the state of Rhode Island. And then we also have uh, a $40 million uh, request to uh, modernize the, uh, the transportation hubs and solve some of the, the problems with, uh, with Ripter uh, that will have both uh, long-term impacts with a uh, more uh, 21st century um, uh, transit authority as well as immediate impacts in construction and the upgrading and the moving of that terminal outside of Kennedy Plaza, putting it near the train station and some other uh, upgrades. So all in all, we have a lot of things that are looking forward. Uh, you know, we continue to invest in ourselves and I think the, 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 the taxpayers of Rhode Island, when they actually see what they're going to get when they see a building, when they see improvements in infrastructure, when they see new roads and bridges, uh, when, when we have to make those type of investments, those bonds usually pass uh, pr pretty easily because they can actually see where their tax dollars are going and it improves the overall quality of life for all Rhode Islanders. And just so our viewers have a sense on how the process works, our governor's proposed a budget with these construction projects as his proposals to go um, before the voters but it has to be approved by the General Assembly before the voters get a chance to vote on them in the fall. That's correct. Exactly. There'll be specific questions and, the, and the, the taxpayers will receive a notice of the questions, explanations of what the ask is and what the dollars will be, uh, be used for. Uh, and uh, each question will be voted on uh, individually and have to be passed individually in order for the state to then be authorized to, to go out and bond to get the money to uh, to do those projects. Then if the bonds pass, the excruciating thing happens next. The process to start getting a project going can take far too long. Director Leach has been very helpful in trying to make this process faster, but we just had the example of the URI Chem School. That bond issue was passed sessions ago, and uh, the, the contract was just awarded within the last month. Mm -hmm. Right now we are eagerly awaiting um, the start uh, of just to start to talk about the contracts for um, the Bristol Vets Home, which is two $45 million phases, and Rhode Island College, which is $40 million. But bond issue passes, you know, gets through the, gets through the legislator, voters vote for it, and then 
we wait and wait and wait to finally get mm -hmm. boots on the ground. I, I have to tell you, I, and I follow politics pretty closely. I, I figure after I vote on something, mm -hmm. things move fairly quickly. And I, I remember voting for all of those projects, and I'm just surprised to hear that our your members, members aren't even working on them. Our members now. remember <laughs> voting for those projects, and they had really feelings of, you know, they were swelled with optimism. Mm -hmm. Now oh. it's tough to explain that it's coming sure. somewhere around the corner. It, it's unfortunate, but that's one of the uh, uh, one of the aspects of our industry, you know, you mm -hmm. know, we always joke that you'll be a, at a groundbreaking and that's just the ceremony and, and our members will call and say, gee, you know, is, do I get an opportunity on that job? And you say, well, that job's not going to start for six more months. That was fake dirt <laughs> that they were throwing with the gold shovel. Just a photo yeah, opportunity. still got a ways to go, ribbon. but, yeah. you know, we'll still take it. At least we know that those projects are in the oh. books and, uh, and, and they will happen. So, oh, and I'd course. just like to also mention and commend the governor. Uh, for, uh, for taking the bold step of uh, realizing that we need to continue to invest in ourselves. If we don't invest in ourselves, then nobody else is going to invest in ourselves. And what's key mm -hmm. to attract business to Rhode Island is to have a 21st century infrastructure, transportation authority, water and sewer, all of those things factor right. in. You know, no, no, no business is going to come here with bridges and, and roads uh, with potholes and, and all the other things that, that, that go with it. We have to have that if we want to attract people to come and invest in Rhode Island. We have to invest in ourselves. I, I couldn't agree more. I think the, some of the politicians talk too much about corporate tax rates when yeah. they're talking about mm. good business climate instead of talking about the things that really matter to all of us business owners included. And you know, the, the easy math, it seems obvious, but we have to explain it again and again. When it comes to these projects, the construction end, they always say, we've often had trouble where they don't count those as jobs, they're temporary jobs. But as Michael is fond of saying, a construction work is, a career is made up of temporary jobs. But we believe, well, and anybody makes a good middle class job, what do they do? They spend in their own economy. Mm -hmm. So when our members are working, instead of what they're doing now, on the couch, afraid you know, if they can make their mortgage or rent payment, they buy a TV, they go out and have a steak dinner, or they have a beer at the local tavern. And uh, we really believe it's a very simple economic addition. If they go to work and they get paid the proper wages and benefits, they will spend. Sure. So we've talked a lot about construction projects, but I know you have some statutory changes, some legislation that you're working on as well. Give our viewers a, a sense on what your legislative priorities as far as changes in state law. Um, again, I'd also like to commend the governor. If you, uh, I think it's Article 16 in his budget it is, is, is uh, tackling the issue that the building trades have been pursuing for, since I've been president in, uh, in 2007. Oh, since 2007, which is the um, employee misclassification, which we believe it's called the underground economy and, uh, and the rampant uh, exploitation of workers uh, in the state of Rhode Island. 30, I, I think we had Rep. Uchi here a couple yeah. years ago talking about same, that exact uh, issue. Think, we've right? talked about in this room <laughs> that very subject many times over the past <laughs> few years. We have. So yeah. we're still talking about it. So hopefully uh, that budget article will pass. What it does is it mimics uh, 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 some of uh, the uh, uh, tactics that Massachusetts has taken with the creation of a task force to address these issues going forward. Uh, and, uh, and we're hopeful that, uh, that that article will pass and start the, prop, the process to uh, clamp down on employers that are misclassifying. And there's, no, there's numerous ways to misclassify. It isn't just about um, uh, anointing somebody as an independent contractor when he should be a, a W-2 employee. It also goes to uh, another whole side of the underground economy, which just is uh, paying in cash and the uh, and the, the lucrative aspect of why that happens. And you know, and I, I was up at the state house uh, last night. We were talking about it. And I heard one of the reps say, um, "Come on, is there really that many people that are out there that 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 would be exploited? You know, who would want to be exploited?" I said, "There's no shortage of people that want to be exploited. It's called running away from child support, just declared bankruptcy." alimony, maybe your status as a worker, et cetera, et cetera. So there are, there are numerous categories on why someone would actually choose to be off the books and work under the table. That and people are desperate for work and, and will do anything that a potential employer asks them to do. We've seen time and time again, we've talked to some of these workers who will gladly whisper to you that they're being exploited for whatever reason, being you know, 1099, not getting overtime, being paid cash but they are afraid to come forward because their choice is job or no job. 
they're not happy about it, but what are they going to mm -hmm. do to replace that job? So they, they, it's not a pleasant situation to be in. We fully understand it, and that's the real economic problem is that it's a job and they're getting paid, however wrongly, and they have nowhere else to go. I'll, mm -hmm. And I'll give you two others, too, because it's not always just those two things. And there are actually individuals that actually try and turn it to their advantage because they would get paid in cash because they might be collecting unemployment insurance and or workers' compensation mm -hmm. or TDI. So they actually use the system to play the system to make it lucrative, lucrative for themselves mm -hmm. as well, which hurts the overall economy. And the focus of the governor's budget article is enforcement, if I got it, it right. It focuses on enforcement. Two it enforcement focuses on it, it focuses on enforcement and it focuses on agency information sharing, uh, which uh, right now is a hindrance between uh, how they operate as agencies. You and mean different state agencies aren't talking to each other? Different state agencies and leave that or not. Mm -hmm. and, and especially where we have, you know, agencies stretched to the limits to carry out their missions. Uh, with, uh, with the amount of people that they have. This is a better coordination of all agencies coming together, Division of Taxation, the Attorney General, the Department of Labor and Training, the Commissioner of Public Safety, all coming together and getting a game plan and doing joint efforts and sharing of information on all of these uh, scenarios. And it's worked well in Massachusetts. It's worked extremely well. I think the first year they recouped uh, $1.8 million uh, that was four years ago this past year. And the other piece to this is that they have to give an annual report to the governor starting in 2015, the effectiveness of this task force. Well, the annual report for 2013 to the, uh, to the governor of Massachusetts was almost $21 million in one year that this task force was able to uncover wow. and, and rightfully That's in a recoup. Year period. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that was one year. The first I mean, year was 1.6 to 20 million. Right. For, to 20 million. So that goes to show you, you know, uh, what's really happening out there, and, and it is rampant. So that is something that uh, that will we we, we will support. Um, and the other piece that, that we have up there that is uh, a paramount to the building trades is uh, apprenticeship utilization on, uh, on public works projects over a million dollars. Now you made some progress on that issue last year with the. Uh, Historic tax credit. Yes, we did. Well, the historic tax credit that passed, and that's another thing in the in the budget as well, mm -hmm. an expansion of I believe it's $54 million of the historic tax program, which we support. Um, that larger projects that are in excess of $10 million, that they'll have uh, the uh, apprenticeship programs. This piece of legislation actually takes the next step that actually says you will actually employ apprentices on these projects for a certain portion of the hours. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's our, in our proposed legislation, it's 15% of the man hours per classification. And what that does is it creates an entry level pathway and a need for us to continue to bring young people into the industry, whether they're union or merit, doesn't matter, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and create that entry level using public policy for workforce development. So we believe it's a, it's a, it's a very good piece of legislation and it uses uh, public policy to create workforce development. Mm -hmm. What do you uh, expect to get from the assembly on this issue? Is there, is there a sense that the assembly members uh, have an appreciation that we need a, a workforce for the future? Well, the two issues we're talking about, the misclass task force seems to be really gaining this time around. I think we're gonna have a clear path. Apprenticeship is still vastly misunderstood mm -hmm. and we have an educational process we've tried to do, but let me explain it to you quite simply. A few years back, we passed that you needed an apprentice program, a state-approved apprentice program, to be a subcontractor or a general contractor on a, a job that's over a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Successfully, that was a great, great thing. But what's occurred is many companies get a paper program. And since apprentices take from three to five years to graduate, you can't point out that that program is false or merely on paper until it's so Many companies have gotten on these jobs because they simply presented the fact that they do have a state approved apprentice program. And lo and behold, not one apprentice works in the job. So this means that 15%, which is very easily done, of hours on a job, you'll have to actually not just have the program, you have to utilize apprentices. Does this cost more money or does it save money it when you're at a project? Less. Apprentices cost less, benefit wise, many times benefit wise mm -hmm. and wage wise. They're learning, they do a lot of the jobs that you would pay more for journeyman to do. It's a, it's a saving to the contractor, and it's also, of course, the bigger picture, it's training people for the future, for their own utilization.
for, for their own, for the, for the industry itself. There is a cost to the extent of the training aspect of it, the training side of it. But as far as the, you know, the, the penny for penny cost on a project, no, it's actually, uh, it's actually mm -hmm. a, a little cheaper because you're allowed to do that. Um, I, I agree with Scott wholeheartedly. I, I think uh, more information needs to be uh, discussed uh, on exactly what this is and exactly, I mean, we've been doing apprenticeship for, for since our inception, all of the unions, and it's, you know, apprentices have happened since the dawn of time. You know, an older mm -hmm. uh, tribesman teaches, a, uh, you know, a younger tribesman how to hunt or fish or, mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be. So it's just using, you know, it's, it's a model that works. And the other thing that, I, that I'd like to mention as well is, is that we believe so strongly in offering these opportunities and having the need and the entry level opportunities for young people in our industry. When I negotiated agreement on behalf of the building trades for private work, large private works, whether it's a power plant or a, or a, a treatment plant or a big uh, or a office or building, or mm -hmm. FM Global, we insert that in our private agreements that we mandate that we also have 15% apprentices on our own project. So it isn't just good when it's you know, on the state's dime, when we have it ourselves with private clients, we impose and, and impress upon them the necessity to have this in their own agreements as well. So it's the standard for your industry as it's far as you're It's the standard concerned. for our industry. The problem out there is that for many people, apprenticeship connotes unions. And you know, I wish it did <laughs> because we do it best. We spend a lot of our own money, management and labor together to train people. But apprenticeship is union neutral. And if you're in construction and you don't have apprentices, it's the model union or non-union for the, the history of, of, of construction. You learn on the job. And now you learn on the job and in a classroom because it's a sophisticated, much more sophisticated mm -hmm. world. So we often have a backlash because they hear the word apprenticeship, our opponents, and they say it's going to cost more because, of course, unions do cost more with better value for, you know, for, for bigger mm -hmm. bucks. But um, it, it can be done by a legitimate company, open shop, non-union, they can have a good apprentice program and they can do exactly what we do and fulfill those obligations and we'd have to walk away. We wouldn't be happy we're not working there, but we'd have to say, yeah, you did it right. right. And to be, be beaten you know, squarely, beaten evenly, is just the nature of our business. And, and it's we, a bidding world. And we get the question, why do you insist on, on that? Why is that so important to you to, to, to bring mm -hmm. young, young people to sure. diversify uh, the building trades and reaching out to minorities and disadvantaged populations to, to bring into our, our industry. And the, the simple reason is, is that we have an aging baby boomer building trade population. Average age of a tradesperson is about 48 years old. And you know we look at the curves and the trends and uh, in the workforce going forward. And you know we're going to have some some big time labor shortages mm -hmm. 10, 15 years from now if we don't start to bring people in. And it's difficult in a down economy to bring people in when we have such high unemployment. So you know this is our way to try and address those issues in a timely manner so that we don't. Uh, uh, you know, really fall off the cliff 15 years from now. And everybody in Rhode Island has a stake in this, including state government. The biggest user of construction services in the state of Rhode Island is the state of Rhode right. Island. So it's, it's a very simple economic equation, supply and demand. If there are less trained people to do the work and the demand is high, your cost of construction is going to go up. And if we can't meet those supplies, they're going to either come from other places or there's going to be less of them. So to get what you need is going to cost you more money. Sure. So I know it's early in the legislative process. Do you have some bill sponsors lined up or are the bills in yet? Have you had some hearings? What, uh, where are we at today? Well, uh, on the misclass misclassification bill, we still have uh, Representative Ucci on the House side mm -hmm. and we have Senator McCafferty on the, uh, on the Senate side. And as far as the apprenticeship, uh, I believe we have uh, Representative Carnival, uh, Carnivali on the uh, House side and uh, Representative, uh, Miller. Uh, Senator Miller on the mm -hmm. Senate side. So, uh, and those bills have been put in. And I also like to note uh, that both those uh, bills passed the Senate last year and then uh, we just uh, had a little bit more work to do on the, uh, on the House okay. side. Well, as, as Scott said earlier, you know, you just have to keep educating people That's right. until they fully understand it. It sounds like you have a, a full plate and then some this year between the bond issues and the different uh, state funding of construction projects. You have some major 
legislative initiatives. I, I wish you great luck this session, well, and I look forward to maybe having a couple of your bill sponsors come on the show, and they can talk about uh, how it's going uh, during the legislative process. We appreciate that. Gentlemen, thank you, thank you very much thank for you. being on Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Pat McWiggin. I'm the executive director of the Providence Plan. We are the home to building futures, and I'm the chair of the executive committee. I want to welcome all of you to the Building Futures Open House. I want to welcome you to the Paragon Mills, and I want to welcome you to Olneyville. Um, our program today is going to be a quick one. My job is to move us along. Our first speaker is going to be Governor Chafee, except he couldn't be here, and I just wanted to do a shout out for him. Uh, the governor and his administration have been a consistent and powerful supporter of the work at Building Futures. The senior senator has been with Building Futures from the very beginning. The senior senator has used his ability to help bring in some federal money, to open doors, to take phone calls, to set up meetings, and to do everything he could and can to make sure that Rhode Island workers, Rhode Island families, and Rhode Island contractors are benefiting from the federal dollars that flow into this state. It is my honor to ask Jack Reed to come to the podium. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, very much Patrick. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today, particularly honored to be here with my colleagues, Congressman Langerman and Congressman Cicilline, and so many other uh, distinguished Rhode Islanders who are committed to helping move our economy forward. John Sinnott of the Rhode Island Association of Contractors, and Michael Sabatoni from the Building Trades Council. Thank you, Michael. Andrew Cortez from Building Futures. Uh, Jeannie Cola from LESC, dear, dear friend from uh, Councilman Solomon, Michael Solomon, Josh Miller, State Senator, and Representative Jeremiah O'Grady. We're here because uh, we understand that there is a, a gap between jobs that are available and skills that Rhode Islanders have. We have to close that gap uh, because uh, without that, people won't get jobs, and without well-skilled workers, we won't be productive and grow our economy. Building futures is part of the solution to this very critical problem. And since 2007, it has been working hard to ensure that uh, we have skilled workers, and those skilled workers have the jobs that will allow them to raise a family in this state. And let me thank the Providence Plan, uh, Youth Build, and Buildings Trade Council, and all their associates and partners for taking this initiative on. Today's open house is a way to connect more and more people with uh, this progressive and very thoughtful approach to bridging the gap between skills and jobs. Uh, it's about opportunity, opportunity for all of our citizens, and an opportunity to grow this economy. And the key is connecting, training, and jobs. And so we need to have not only the trainers, but the employers, and that's why we're all here today. And we have a common mission, a common purpose, which is to get the skills up to the level where they can contribute to the company and get the company to hire those skilled workers. We've been doing this at the national level, Congressman Langer and Congressman Cicilline, Senator Whitehouse and I, working to ensure that the funding we've provided in this latest budget uh, supports job training programs, supports the Job Corps, supports youth build, supports those initiatives that will result in jobs for our people, the number one challenge that we face today. So I'm just delighted to be here and delighted to lend my support to this great effort. Thank you very, very much for being here also. Thank you. Um, Senator Whitehouse is not able to be here today. He is out of town and I think out of the country. Uh, but I want to make sure to give a shout out to him. Sheldon and his staff are there all the time. Anytime we have needed them, the help that they have provided, they get it. They help us every time that we need it. And I just want to thank Sheldon uh, for, on behalf of all of us. <laughs> Congressman David Cicilline. Thank you, Pat. Uh, good morning. I am uh, really 
thrilled to be here with uh, first with my colleagues, Senator Reid and Congressman Langevin, and uh, I know uh, Senator Whitehouse uh, is represented well by Tony Simon. All three are, have been incredible advocates for this program and for workforce training and for investing in apprenticeship programs, so I'm happy to be with all of them, as well as with Senator Miller, Representative O'Grady, Representative Hull, uh, many, many leaders in the labor movement, George Nee, Paul McDonald, all, many members of the building trades, too many, as Jim said, to mention, but certainly Michael Sabatoni, the leader, and Andrew Cortez, thank you for your incredible leadership of Building Futures. Thank you to the Providence Plan, because without the Providence Plan and the really excellent applications for funding, uh, it would have been hard to advocate for it and successfully. Uh, so, Pat, thank you to you and your board. Uh, thank you to the great staff of Building Futures. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation about workforce training uh, in the last several months. Uh, the President spoke about it during the State of the Union. We have an example here at Building Futures of a spectacular, not just job training, but career preparation program that's effective and that's cost efficient and that's producing real results. And we're going to hear from two graduates I know will be the best speakers of the morning that are going to talk about the program. Um, it is making a real difference, but I want to say at the very outset, it would not have happened without the strong relentless and wonderful partnership of the building trades. Uh, this apprenticeship program happened because they came to the table with a real commitment to make it a success, to invest in it, to put resources behind it, and um, Andrew masterfully coordinated all the many different personalities in those early days. Uh, but it's been a great success in large part because of their commitment. The second piece of it is the partners like Gilbain and Brown University and Providence College um, it's important that when graduates complete this program that they actually have work. And so the willingness of the private sector to really avail themselves of this great apprenticeship program. Um, in the end, I think they'll all, they all find that it's in their own best interest because they're getting highly skilled, great workers. But for the city and for the state, it's a particular source of pride because these are individuals who come from our city that are now working on development projects all across the city. And so it sort of goes full cycle. And um, it's been a great success. It's something we should be really proud proud of. It's something we have to continue to grow and we're celebrating it today uh, with this open house and you can see by the attendance the excitement. Uh, we just have to be sure that we can continue to support this program so we can continue to uh, create great career paths for many, many more Rhode Islanders. I know that there are some recent kind of assessments that were done about uh, building futures. The United States Department of Labor and the Aspen Institute have both recognized building futures and the, the uh, pre-apprenticeship program as national models. And these are obviously uh, organizations that, that have a tremendous amount of credibility. And it's a real testament to the success of the program, uh, both here in Rhode Island and all across the country. And um, I think it's just particularly important that we take uh, moments like this to remind ourselves of all the people who helped build this program, what a difference it's making in the life of our city and our state, and equally importantly, what a difference it's making in the lives of individuals who successfully graduate and leave here very proud uh, to be part of a very important industry in Rhode Island. So congratulations and thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m. Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. Hi, I'm Bob Delaney. 
Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. This evening's edition will host Legislative Issues with Jim Parisi, where we bring the legislature into your living room. We hope you enjoy this edition of Legislative Issues and Labor Vision. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field rep with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. Now that the General Assembly session has just started, we've been bringing some labor leaders in to talk about the, le the legislative agenda that they've got, and we're pleased to have two folks from the building trades joining us today, Mike Sabatoni and Scott Duhamel. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jim, for having us. So I know you guys have been on the show before, but I always like starting with a little bit of background. Mike, um, w what unions are part of the building and construction trades? Uh, the building and construction trades council is comprised of 16 trade unions uh, that represent roughly about 10,000 workers in and around the, uh, the state of Rhode Island. Uh, they consist of uh, my trade laborers, uh, Scott's trade uh, painters, uh, glazers, uh, iron workers, brick masons, electricians, plumbers and pipe fitters, uh, carpenters, uh, pretty much every craft that's uh, necessary to construct a, a building and, uh, and service and maintain and construct our, our infrastructure. And you uh, have gotten together, all the different unions have come together. What kinds of things do you do uh, when you come together as opposed to each union doing their own thing, representing their own craft? Well, the hardest part is making that come together, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, a, it's an art form. But mm -hmm. uh, um, usually we all have a commonality of interests in economic development and uh, the continuing employment of the men and women that we represent in building the roads and the bridges and uh, uh, the buildings that you see in and around the skyline of, uh, of Rhode Island. Uh, the economic downturn has had some impact on our, uh, on our unemployment, uh, which is why uh, you know, we spend a lot of time at the State House on legislative initiatives that will put our members back to work and keep the investments in the, uh, in the state of Rhode Island that employ the members we represent. Okay. And you, you mentioned uh, unemployment. I know it's, it's been high for a number of years. Are, are you guys seeing any difference in, in how much your members are actually working now compared to a couple of years ago? Is there an uptick in the economy? There was a, a little uptick more on the civil side, which I'll call the, uh, the, the road and uh, bridge construction over the last uh, probably 18 months or so. But the vertical construction, which we call in our industry, which is the building construction, has been severely impacted uh, since the, 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 the Great Recession of 2008 and beyond uh, to the point we have today where uh, there is very little, if any, vertical construction and that has a major impact on all of the building trades as, as a whole. And we use numbers in our industry, we're probably looking at unemployment hovering around 40% uh, when you hear the average in the state is 9.1 in our industry, it's, uh, it's 40 and in some instances even, even greater depending on the, on the craft. Yeah. And here we are in Rhode Island sitting at the highest unemployment rate in the country, mm -hmm. but uh, again, your, your members don't uh, look anything like the overall rate, which is 9.1%. So um, the issue of unemployment is really important considering what kind of legislative initiatives you uh, folks are working on. Why don't we start talking about uh, the priorities that the building and construction trades has in the General Assembly this year? Okay, well, let me make a quick comment about unemployment. You know, when it, you've seen it over the country. One of the stats is that people disappear off the rolls because they are finally unable to collect. They've reached their last. That's occurring with our members. They finally reached the point where they may not extended benefits. That some of them have no more benefits at all. Mm -hmm. And the other alarming factor, and you know, the state is trying its best, but unemployment is very difficult to get to get to and get your unemployment compensation. Whereas. Years ago in the state, in the construction industry, you'd be laid off on a Friday, you'd be on the phone on a Monday, maybe a couple of hours, you'd be straightened out, and the following week you'd receive your check. We have had continual horror stories of members who've been on the phone for two to three weeks, unable to connect, mm -hmm. thus unable to collect, and meanwhile living on nothing. And this, is not, this has been happening for the past two years. And it's unbelievable the people that come to our halls and say, can you help me? 
I can't get through an unemployment, mm -hmm. I can't get my unemployment, and they put the time in. Yeah, and that's an issue where you would hope state government would be more responsive to people who are suffering from not having work in the first place. Well, the irony is we laid off people there at the time of the highest unemployment, so you have less people to take care of more people, which doesn't make sense. And I know they're doing their best, but it's uh, never been like this. It's a, it's a really continually strange story how you cannot get through to something that should be mm -hmm. like that. And like you said, it's not an old issue. I remember walking a picket line two years ago on Pontiac Avenue protesting a layoff over at the unemployment office. Mm -hmm. So what's, uh, what's the top priorities? Of the, of the building construction trades? Well, uh, I would say our number one priority is getting the, the economy going. Uh, so any uh, legislative initiative, whether it be a budget article or a piece of legislation that will help uh, stimulate and prime the pump uh, in our interest, which is construction, uh, investments in uh, infrastructure, buildings, um, is, uh, is our top priority because we also believe that, again, that has the, uh, the surrounding effect to stimulate and help in a lot of other areas, uh, not only in construction, but uh, education, et cetera. I know you and I have had discussions mm -hmm. in the past with regards to the moratorium on school construction. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we always talk about, and you hear our, our elected officials talk about the importance of education, but yet we have some of the oldest schools in the country. Uh, and um, you know the necessity to you know spend some money and reinvest not only in our young people but in the in the buildings that uh, that mm -hmm. house to educate them and your members as well. I, I was just astounded that in the height of all this unemployment that we imposed a three-year moratorium on new school construction and renovation. It was just astonishing to me that well, that it, passed. And thankfully, we're coming to the end of that three-year period, and hopefully things can get going again. It's even more ironic that at a time when construction materials leveled off and actually started the cost of construction materials and construction activity decreased, money was, uh, was cheap, rates were low, uh, at a time when you would think it would make sense for all of the benefits to actually excel uh, your program because of the needs and the necessities that we would stop altogether. Because now interest rates will rise. As demand rises, we start to crawl out of the recession. The cost of materials will rise. So I was of the opinion, as my counsel was, that that was the perfect time to not to stop or eliminate was, was actually the perfect time to accelerate for all of the benefits, including mm -hmm. the effect it would have had on unemployment and the benefit of the cost of the construction activity as well. Mm -hmm. In the midst of this, you know, what's happened with the economy is it dropped out. Schools uh, construction particularly hurt us because that's prevailing wage, which is a level playing field for the contractors that our members work for. They pay prevailing wage. So historically, we've done a large percentage of school work. And one of the things about schoolwork, oftentimes it's done in the off season when there is no school. So it's a very tight schedule with a lot of hours. And oftentimes our members would make in three or four months, five months worth of hours. And in our world, that translates into healthcare because our people have to achieve so many hours to be able to get healthcare. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, that disappearing on top of all our other issues is becoming really hurtful. And as you well know, you know, it's kind of obvious, but remember, our members have children at those very schools mm -hmm. that are in disarray, and you know, they're worried about their children, never mind their jobs when they improve those schools, worry about the conditions those children and those teachers have to work in when the window's leaking and the roof's got a hole in it and the air conditioning or the heat is mm -hmm. off. So it's been really a, a total mess as far as that's going. Right, and not just in the urban core, but no, the same, over, same is over, true in the suburbs over, as well. Every community. Mm -hmm. and you know. Direct contrast, in Massachusetts, they had a, um, what's the fund called, Michael? They had a, a fund diverted specifically to school construction, and they built some wonderful mm -hmm. schools, improved schools. Mm -hmm. They are booming right next door. And, you know, we have to watch that at all time with envy mm -hmm. as it's occurring, wishing that was occurring within our state. Yeah, if, right. if I'm not mistaken, the state of Massachusetts actually uh, uh, dictates, I think it's a penny or two off of the state sales tax that goes directly into a, a building authority fund uh, for, the, uh, for the public mm -hmm. school system there. And that's why, you know, I travel throughout Massachusetts. I have a young, young sons that play in various uh, AAU teams. And, uh, you know, I'm astonished when I go... Uh, to Massachusetts and see some of the brand new high schools and middle schools and uh, you know the effect that a program like that can have 
uh, on a whole community because basically those buildings are the centers of the communities. Uh, and uh, you know, it's something where I think we can, uh, we can look at. Uh, I know this session they'll be looking at different ways to, uh, to fund schools going forward. I know that potentially there are some candidates that will also be talking about their thoughts on how to uh, start the pump and, and start to reinvest in our, in our public buildings mm -hmm. and obviously schools. Sure. So um, that's something that we will be uh, heavily supportive of and any uh, influence that we can bring and support, we will, we will be behind that. Yeah, that's terrific. And I know the Senate in particular is taking a look at school construction now that the moratorium is winding down. Uh, yes. Senator Pearson's heading up a task force looking at those issues. We just need to make sure that we put some interesting and novel ideas before them and maybe we can get in that same direction that Massachusetts If they has ask said. us, we will give them our opinion. <laughs> and maybe we might just tell them anyway yeah. our opinion. And you know, we have some other specifics that we've been working on, you know, still on an educational theme. Uh, this year, we're hopeful that uh, that the pieces will come together on the uh, South Street Station project, which is the collaboration between Brown, URI, and Rick uh, for sharing that space in, a, in, a tr in probably the best public-private partnership I can think about uh, or think of with a uh, educational institutions. Mm -hmm. And it's also our belief as a, as a building trades council that that's an impact project down in the area of the city just outside the, the, the knowledge district line but that is something that uh, that if we take the initiative and get that going I think will be the catalyst now that the 195 Commission has started to put out their request for proposals for other uh, interested parties mm -hmm. so uh, you know making a major investment in that area as uh, as both public and private Rhode Island entities I think will stimulate and uh, and attract other uh, national entities to say, hey, something's going on in Providence. We have a unique opportunity here, and we're confident that that'll be the catalyst for hopefully uh, some major development on the 195 land. And, and but that is going to be need. I know the governor has put in his budget uh, that uh, that portion. Uh, they have to have the, uh, the the commitment for the lease for Rick and URI to uh, as an anchor tenant for that space. Uh, but uh, there are a few other pieces that have to come together. But that is. Uh, that is probably our major uh, economic development legislative initiative that we'll continue to support and pursue in this session. And this is the building that's going to host uh, the School of Nursing run by, exactly. by both uh, it, it, It's the, the project called the South Street Station. We formally refer to it as the Dynamo House. At mm -hmm. this point, it's a $200 million project that mm -hmm. includes three separate parts. One is actually that building, which would house URI Rick Nursing, and Brown administration in the actual building. Next door would be graduate student housing and a parking garage. And for us, the plan at this point, if it would go through, is all three of those would commence simultaneously, which would put a number of people to work in their lengthy jobs. People would go there and they would have a really long employment. And in our world, there's been far too many short jobs. We've done a lot of additions, renovations, small projects. We dispatch members and they, they're dispatched for as long as they need it. They could go to work for two weeks, they could go to work for two months, or on a project like that, they could be there for four or five or six months. So we consider that. And as Michael said, uh, we joked about it for a while, that's an iconic building in the jewelry district, which I prefer over the knowledge district, but you know, they want a brand, so we'll brand it. <laughs> but it, I call it the nicest birdhouse in Providence. It's mm -hmm. left with its windows open for the past two years. It's a beautiful building. It's the highest freestanding uh, building from floor to ceiling in Rhode Island with mm -hmm. nothing there because you know they used to have all the you know the stuff for the powerhouse. In there. Right, I don't remember. But you know you're going to try to get people to buy 195 lots, and as they drive by, they see that one building looming, empty, sitting there, mm -hmm. centrally located. So as he said, it'll be a more than a catalyst. I think it'll really be a sign that we're we're serious about. Turning that area. Mm, sure. So, if everything falls in place, how soon can your members get to work on this project? Well, the, some of the best guesstimates and the most optimistic guesstimates. Far more optimistic I'm than op me. <laughs> I've, I've turned towards optimism in the uh, in 2014 because I do think there are signs that we're moving in the right direction. But the optimistic view for that project would be uh, June of this year if everything falls in place. Mm -hmm. And that's highly optimistic. If anything were to be done by the end of this year, if there was a scratching in the ground, I'd feel very good about it. But there's a particularly uh, a well respected and a legitimate developer behind this. We think Brown partnership, who better than Brown? They're going nowhere. They've proved themselves time and time again. 
all the elements that seem to be there with very little ask from the state that this could be, it would really be a jump start for our, for our people. Mm -hmm. And I just think it makes so much sense now that you have the, uh, the Warren Alpert Medical School there. You've got the corridor that could connect the financial district through a knowledge district or health district directly through the hospitals. You'd have a nursing education program there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just believe that the opportunities are endless. But once we make that initial investment, I truly believe that'll attract other interests to come mm -hmm. in and make investments in Rhode Island as well on those uh, freed up parcels on 195. That, that sounds terrific. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but uh, both of you just uh, stay in your seats. We're going to uh, continue the discussion. And please join us next week when we do part two of the Building and Construction Trades Legislative Agenda. Thank you, gentlemen, thank and you. thank you for joining thank you, Jim, us. For us. As you're well aware, February is Black History Month across the United States. We at Labor Vision are proud to celebrate this very special occasion. All month long, Labor Vision will provide a series of profiles and highlights focusing on the civil rights movement and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. We hope you are inspired by our Black History series. Our last panelists are Nick and Eugene. And it's so interesting because last week I was reading an article in the Providence Journal, and wow, they came up with some big news that there's racial bias in traffic stops <laughs> by the police. And we know that this has been going on for years and years and years. And so I was wondering if you could tell us about, uh, just first of all, define racial profiling for us and if you could share about how it has impacted your lives personally and the lives of others in our state, particularly youth of color. Right, thank you for that. Uh, first of all, it looks like uh, Jim Crow Jr. has grown up and now Jim Crow Jr. lives in the shadows. You know, whether it's the disparity with uh, labor, uh, economic disparity in our uh, communities, uh, whether it's suspension in schools or uh, racial profiling. Uh, the, the battle of the civil rights movement has not gone away. You know, it went under, it went in the shadows for a little while and uh, unfortunately for us, many, many of us became complacent, uh, not realizing that the fire was slowly being turned up again, uh, and so here we are. What is racial profiling? Okay. Guess racial pro profiling can be described as being singled out. Okay. And you are singled out not based on whether or not you've actually committed a crime, but you're singled out because of your skin color. All right, that's basically it. You know, you're walking down the street, you're singled out because of your skin color, you happen to look left, now you're suspicious. Okay. You're walking home from school, you just got off of your bus, you're walking home with your backpack, you have a backpack, you are now suspicious. If you happen to be in the wrong neighborhood, whatever that means, you are now suspicious. If you want a, uh, a more up-to-date picture of what that would look like, if you're going to the store and you're walking home with Skittles and iced tea, okay, that is racial profiling. Okay, so it's not just done by law enforcement, it's also done by wannabe law enforcement uh, individuals. And so, as uh, my brother here, Mr. Almeida, has said, you know, we've been battling We've been at this for a while, and, and certainly racial profiling has been around since before the country was started. But, you know, recently with the, uh, the murder of Cornell Young, uh, many in the community uh, prior to, to my uh, 
and Eugene joining this movement, uh, were involved in pushing for legislation to uh, eliminate the practice. And so we, we had some success early on. We did have legislation passed that allowed us to uh, collect data on uh, racial profiling stops. And guess what we found? We found that minorities are more than likely to be pulled over, I think, four times is more likely than their majority counterparts. And it also found that a majority of the stops didn't result in anything. They were just pulled over and nothing was found in the vehicle. So, um, you know, certainly you would think that uh, one piece of legislation would be enough to try to curtail some of this stuff, but no, it continues to happen. We've had several studies, and as you know, we recently had a new study uh, that was released that, were, that also illustrates what we already know. You know, why do we need a study to tell us what we already know, right? So this practice continues to this day, and we're out advocating to make sure that, uh, you know, this kind of thing stops. And the reason why it's important that we're doing the work that we do and that folks in the community are doing the work that they do is that if you look at the year 2040, which is right around the corner, right? That's not that far away. Uh, a majority of the people in this country will be people of color. So do we do something now to try to stop that practice? Or do we end up in a South Africa type environment in the year 2040 where we have sort of an apartheid system here in the US? Not to say that we <laughs> don't have one now, you know. But that's something that we, we, we need to look at. We need to be serious about that, okay? I'm from the school of Malcolm X, right? And Malcolm X would say, how do you speak to another man that talks a different language than you do? This man comes up to you every day and he kicks you. And you go, wow, that hurt. <laughs> and you try to get him to stop. Look, stop kicking me but they don't understand your language, right? So now this man comes and kicks you again and you get wise to it and you kick him back. Now when you kick them back, you've established rapport and you're now speaking the same language, okay? And at that point, you can have a conversation and move forward and decide if you wanna kick each other every day, okay? So we're gonna to get to the point in this country where if these practices don't stop, school suspensions, wage inequality, uh, all sorts of, of other things where people are gonna start kicking back. And when that happens, you know, it's, it's, it's not gonna be pretty, but people have to defend themselves as, as we learned from uh, Mr. Mandela who recently passed away. You know, he got to the point where he said, look, we have to defend ourselves. Right. So we don't need to go down that road. We don't need to go down that road. We just need to do the right thing now so that when that year comes, when that future comes, we are in a better place. We are a better country and we are a better uh, community. Thank you so much. I was gonna ask if you could talk a little bit about the key components of the Comprehensive Racial Profiling Act. Actually, before I go into that, I wanted to kind of answer the second part of the first question on how racial profiling has impacted my life and in youth. Um, I grew up in the, the Mount Hope area in Providence. Um, I could share probably thousands of stories of situations where police had stopped me throw me against the wall, pants down to my knees, search me. When I first got my license, I had a 1974 Ford Galaxy. I was so proud of my beat up car. They pulled me over, emptied my trunk, drove away because they didn't find anything. Left me sitting on the curb crying because I was embarrassed. I was hurt. 
as a 16 year old. You know, I had, I grew up experiencing that type of situation over and over again. And I tell you, I wasn't a perfect kid, but I wasn't a bad kid. I was a kid, you know? Um, once I graduated, I had the opportunity to join the military, and I did. I joined the military, I served my country, I were deployed various times. Um, I, I was able to travel to other countries, take my kids to other countries. And what was amazing about this experience is not, I can't remember one incident, one situation where I was profiled because I was black. I lived in Germany for a number of years and it was times I was profiled because I was American, <laughs> right? But never because I was black. And my kids had the same experience. We came back from the military and you know, I started working for a corporation at the time. We moved to other states. And even in that time, I mean, we lived in Georgia and sadly things happened, but <laughs> I can't tell you a story. Hey, how about Providence, huh? Who's driven to Providence lately? <laughs> Just Angel Tavares. Okay, so that's all right. You know, apparently the roads are kind of bad in Providence. How bad are they? Well, they don't have potholes. They have geological phenomena. <laughs> you know what's bad when you don't have an expose by uh, Channel 12, you have an expose by National Geographic. Here to talk a little bit more about it, please welcome some drivers from Providence Wheelie and the Rims. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.